Welcome to the VCU Department of Internal Medicine Grand Rounds. Uh, today is Thursday, February 24, 2022. Um, so just a couple of quick things before we get started here. Uh, everybody knows that we are still in a virtual environment uh, for the remainder of this spring semester. Uh, looking forward to the fall, um, hopefully getting back into person uh, meetings quick thing uh, everybody knows by now to submit a question. You can use the chat box, the Q&A, or raise your hand at the end. We will save about five minutes for um, questions towards the end, and the session will be recorded and available on the Department of Internal Medicine website under Education and Grand Rounds. So uh, today's session is sponsored by the Division of Infectious Diseases, um, and the title today is Lessons learned from a lifetime of playing and watching soccer, uh, musings on leadership and academic medicine. And I'm pleased to introdu introduce Dr. Gonzalo Behrman, who is the uh, current chair of the Division of Infectious Disease, the Richard Wenzel Professor of Internal Medicine and Hospital Epidemiologist here at VCU Health System in Richmond, Virginia. He's a graduate of Colgate uh, University, SUNY of Buffalo School of Medicine and Biomedical Sciences and Columbia University. He completed a residency in internal medicine and was chief resident both at SUNY in Buffalo. He then completed a fellowship in infectious disease, a residency in preventative medicine and public health, both at Cornell. And he is board certified in internal medicine, infectious disease, and general preventative medicine and public health. Since 2013, Dr. Behrman has been an attending physician on the internal medicine and infectious disease consult service here at VCU. He served as clerkship director of the VCU M3 internal medicine clerkship from 2005 to 2011, and was also the fourth year AI director, the acting internship director. He lectures in M1 population medicine, M2 medical microbiology, and is course director for both contemporary issues and controversies in public health within the VCU Department of Epidemiology and Community Medicine, and also an M4 elective on medicine in literature. Since 2005, Dr. Behrman has worked on the VCU Global Health Program through the Honduras Medical Relief Brigade, a medical relief effort bringing medical and public health assistance to rural Honduran communities. In 2013, Dr. Behrman launched a medical literary messenger, an online magazine for humanities and medicine, where he serves as the editor-in-chief. He serves as a section editor for current infectious diseases reports and is an editor-in-chief of current treatment options in infectious disease. From 2013 to 2015, he was chair of the Society for Healthcare Epidemiology of America Guidelines Committee, and his current research focuses on epidemiology of hospital-acquired infection. He has multiple peer-reviewed publications in Annals of Internal Medicine, Archives of Internal Medicine, Archives of Medical Research, Clinical Infectious Disease, Infection Control, and Hospital Epidemiology, as well as the Journal of Clinical Microbiology, Infectious Disease Reports, American Journal of Infection Control, uh, as well as the Journal of Hospital Infection and Journal of Infection. Uh, Dr. Behrman, for those of you who have met him, he has a passion for many things in life, and I think he's going to share one of his uh, great passions for soccer uh, and leadership. So we, I am pleased to introduce Dr. Behrman. Uh, I will turn it over to you. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you, Dr. Bergman. Extremely kind of you uh, with that introduction, uh, way too generous. Uh, Thank you again. I'm no longer running the infection control service, but I have been a part, uh, big part of VCU infection control over the last uh, almost 20 years. So let me just change the screen here to share screen. Hopefully that will work. Give me a second. And if you could give me a, a verbal that the, the screen is a go or a thumbs up. Okay, everyone. Thank you again uh, for the invitation. It's an honor again to be at VCU Grand Rounds. You know, I've been here almost 20 years. So I apologize if I repeat myself with a couple of, of, of themes or ideas, but the goal is really to try to do something differently, uh, different than my prior presentations over the years. Uh, so it's a little bit outside the box, so just bear with me and I hope that you'll find it relevant and maybe even enjoyable. So the title here is Lessons Learned from a Lifetime of Playing and Watching Soccer, uh, Musings on Leadership and Academic Medicine and uh, I'm Gonzalo. So here are my disclosures. Prior research grants from Pfizer Pharmaceuticals, BioVigil, Vestigen Technologies, Cardinal Healthcare, Molnick Healthcare, AO Orthopedic Foundation grant, and BDH COVID-19 research grants, one of which is currently ongoing. 
My other disclosure is that I was never, or was uh, neither a professional footballer or, or nor a manager. Sorry, sometimes I use the word footballer, consider that a soccer player. Um, I was never let, rose to that level of kind of competition, but I did play competitively all through college and was the goalkeeper for Colgate University, and I continue to play. Uh, so it's still something that's very important to me. Uh, it's true also that I probably watch more soccer now than I play, but it's still, I still remain a student of the game and I continue to learn. And I find that to be really a lot of fun for me and still provides a, not only physical activity, but for a sort of kind of emotional and, um, and, and kind of uh, intellectual growth for me. Now, for those of you who think sporting analogies are fluff, or this may be fluff, this has actually been looked at in much deeper perspectives. I would refer to you uh, to this book here, How Football Explains the World by Franklin Four. Really excellent read, and it really goes beyond the sport. And to quote Franklin Four, he writes that soccer isn't the same as Bach or Buddhism, but is often more deeply felt than religion, and just as much a part of the community's fabric, a repository of tradition. So it certainly can resonate with people on a level that is much deeper than mere sport. So let's explore this a little further. I'm going to go through 10 lessons that I've learned by way of sport, life, academic medicine, and leadership. Lesson number one, win, lose, or draw, there is almost always another match. Setbacks abound. Burnout is a threat really in all aspects of life. So I'm going to introduce my, my compatriot, my countryman, Lionel Messi. So anyone who knows anything about the sport knows he's considered the best footballer in the world. And you have two images. You have Lionel Messi on the left, in the 2014 World Cup final, where we lost to Germany 1-0, head down, dejected, massive loss. And then you have him in 2021, post hoisting the Copa America, another major win or coup for the Argentine national soccer team. And to quote Messi, he said, I start early and I stay late, day after day, year after year. It took me 17 years and 114 days to become an overnight success. So we can actually learn some things from Lionel Messi. And this is not just me saying it. There's actually publications out there. This is lessons to learn from Lionel Messi. Never give up. And what I'm referring to is the issue of pers or the concept of perseverance and grit. He was born to a working class family in Rosario, Argentina. Definitely not a wealthy upper crust Argentine. He was diagnosed with growth, hom growth hormone deficiency at age 11. Family did not have the money really to, to, to undergo all the necessary treatments. He was invited because of his his talent at a very young age to the famed Barcelona Youth Academy, La Masia, at age 13. The club agreed to pay for his growth hormone deficiency medical treatments, which were a huge expense. And he resisted family pressures and homesickness to return to Argentina. It's tough to leave the country when you're a 13-year-old boy. It was really, in many ways, a triumph of individual grit coupled with an organizational environment, which gets me to the next point. Organiza organizational support is critically important to the success of anyone. Now, going back to the, to the Example of Messi, we have here the five pillars of La Masia of FC Barcelona, considered one of the premier soccer youth academies in the world. And they really inculcate in their players, in their staff, in the entire culture of La Masia, humility, effort, ambition, respect, and teamwork. It's really the launching pad for success as a group of all these people seeking to be professional football. So the first thing I want to mention is long-term success starts with an organizational focus. So how's that relevant? Well, think about this. Seems like the new norm for healthcare workers, or more acute, exacerbated norm, is basically burnout. Tears, nightmares, and exhaustion. Burnout is a new normal for hospital workers. This is in December uh, of 11, 20, uh, 2020. I don't think much has changed since then. If you take my specialty, which is infectious disease, and this is for, for Medscape, uh, infectious diseases, when asked what specialties are happiest outside of work now, ID is at 45%. Sad to hear that we are so pessimistic and unhappy about things, but that at least is what has been report, reported uh, by way of Medscape. What contributes most to ID physician burnout? I don't think this is unique to us, and I think many of you can relate to this. The top ones are going to be too many bureaucratic tasks, and of course, spending too many hours at work, et cetera, or things that lead to a lack of control and autonomy. Again, I don't think these are necessarily unique to the infectious diseases special. What may be unique to infectious disease is something that we're exploring. Uh, by way of uh, ongoing research. And this is something that we published with Susie Hoyt at the University of Toronto and Sarah Hesser from the University of Massachusetts. Is healthcare epidemiology unique drivers in burnout, uh, is looking for unique drivers in uh, burnout, sorry, and may drive burnout in colleagues. In other words, we really need to explore with greater detail by way of research the drivers and prevalence and potential solutions for burnout in healthcare epidemiologists, which are infectious disease specialists. But here's the catch. 
There's also research needs to better understand the perceived impact of infection preventive strategies on healthcare worker burnout on, or on the burnout of our colleagues. You know, maybe all those policies, those procedures, those timeouts, those hand hygiene badges, they may be eroding some of the, uh, the autonomy and leading to some of the burnout in our colleagues. The ultimate goal is to define infection prevention practices with a minimal collateral damage on wellness and burnout. That's part of an organizational approach. Now, leading or carrying on to the organizational approach, I refer you to this very interesting paper that was published in 2016. It's Interventions to Prevent and Reduce Physician Burnout, a Systematic Review and Meta-Analysis. It was a 15 randomized controlled trials and 37 cohort studies. We're looking at a combination of individual and organizational interventions, which most commonly included mindfulness training, stress management classes or directions at least, small group discussions, and of course, duty hour restrictions, workload reductions. And what was observed is that individual and organizational interventions can reduce physician burnout by 10%. In this particular paper, 54% down to 44%. That story doesn't end there. Really, the leaders in organizational approach to minimizing burnout, incre increasing wellness and success of physicians is, is the Mayo Clinic. And this paper was published in 2017, looking at their organizational strategies for reducing burnout across their healthcare team. First is acknowledging the problem. Second is harnessing the power of leadership. Three is developing and implementing targeted work interventions. Four is cultivating a community of work. Five is using rewards and incentives. Six is aligning values. Seven is promoting flexibility and work-life integration. Eight is providing resources to promote resilience and self-care. And last but not least, I think this is really important, facilitating and funding organizational science to improve all of the above. So with that in mind, Mayo Clinic physician burnout is currently, or at least was currently, approximately two thirds of the rate of national rates, 32% to 48%. So something to really take seriously when we're, spec when we're looking at organiza organizational factors to maximize wellness, maximize professional success of our healthcare workers. But with that in mind, I also wanna come back to the discussion that individual factors are still important. In fact, I think they are hugely important. So with that in mind, I'm going to introduce you to Ms. Rose Lavelle, Lavelle and the concept of grit. Now, for, for those who don't know Rose Lavelle, she's an American soccer player. Uh, she scored probably one of the most brilliant goals of the 2019 FIBA Women's World Cup, actually in the final against Holland. As you can see here, she's striking the ball in the back of the net after a 50-yard run uh, with, uh, with tr tremendous pace and dribbling skills, really leaving the Dutch hopeless, helpless, and hapless, and really scoring the winning goal for the United States. And to quote Ms. Lavelle, she wrote, she, she uh, states, to excel, you have to learn to be comfortable being uncomfortable. And this is really important, being willing to respond to adversity. It gets me to this important book, Grit by Angela Duckworth, The Power of Passion and Perseverance. I strongly encourage you to look into this book. If you're pressed for time, which is quite common, check out the TED Talk. It's worth 18 minutes of your time to listen to Angela's discussion on grit. Grit is essentially the predictor of success. What is grit? It's passion and perseverance for long-term goals. Grit is about having an ultimate concern, a goal essentially that you care about so much that it organizes and gives meaning to almost everything you do. Grit is holding steadfast to that goal, particularly when you fall down, even when you screw up, and even when progress toward that goal is halting or slow. In other words, can you stick it out for the long haul? With that in mind, I want to switch to resilience. And resilience is an important concept. And there's actually st studies and some good literature out there on resilience at work. I'm going to just summarize five tips to recharge and not just endure. I'll refer you to the Harvard Business Review, which has a nice publication on emotional intelligence and resilience. It's so the importance of within teams, as individuals, cultivating compassion, compartmentalizing work, doing something as serial monotasking, so it's not being overwhelmed, whelmed, taking detachment breaks, which are both deliberate and time. Developing mental agility. This takes patience, and this takes actually, um, this takes being um, being aware and actually being deliberate here uh, to learn how to pause and observe stress, stressful experiences from a neutral standpoint. Best response flexibility, and of course, exercising mindfulness for emotional stability and cognitive flexibility. All of these things take deliberate practice and grit to do. So this brings me to the next point. A paper that's currently in press that I had the pleasure and honor to write with Rebecca Mullen here at UCU and Dr. Susie Hoda at the University of Toronto. It's leading teams while exhausted, perspectives from healthcare epidemiology and beyond. And we argued that leading teams during times of stress really requires a multimodal approach. 
There is no single best way to do it. The goal is essentially to promote stability during times of crisis. I relate to this during the COVID-19 pandemic, particularly early on. Being able to define what's urgent versus important, listening to team members, being comfortable telling individuals, teams, even an organization, I don't know. Being aware of team dynamics, doing frequent check-ins with the team. The frequency, is un, you know, the, the frequency is unclear. You have to define that as essentially in real time. Being aware of both individual and team resilience. Remember, the resilience is not just of the individual, but also of the group. And last but not least, aggressively advocating for system level changes to mitigate stress and burnout. We think these are uh, really important and have this uh, coming up in, 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 in a soon to be published manuscript. So switching gears, I wanna to go to lesson two. Sometimes agendas are discordant, even in the same organization. So with that, I'll start with this, this, this reference. The book, An International Bestseller of Soccernomics by uh, Simon Cooper and Stefan Szymanski. In uh, the subtitle of this is Why England Loses, Why Germany, Spain, and France Win, and Why One Day Japan, Iraq, and the United States Will Become Kings of the World's Most Popular Sport, or at least arguably so. And to quote the authors, part of the manager's job is to act as a scapegoat, shielding his club owners for blame. Remember, for the club owners, it's the business. For the managers, it's quite different. So with that in mind, let's frame this discussion with a real, cr really critical question. And I refer you to this book by Simon Sinek, which I think is absolutely superb. It's Start With Why, How Great Leaders Inspire Everyone to Take Action. You need to ask why you're doing what you do. You have to be deliberate because this sets the intent for absolutely everything. So I'd like to come to this next reference, which is a Betrayal of Trust, a Collapse or the Collapse of Global Public Health by Laurie Garrett. And in this, in this book, which is it's a bit of a tome, it's about 800 pages, but it boils down to this. Public health is an essential trust between government and its people in a pursuit of health for all. This includes a healthcare system that follows the primary maxim of medicine, which is do no harm. So for summary is that healthcare systems that fail to relentlessly pursue infection prevention betray the maxim of medicine and betray the public's trust. So with that in mind, I'm going to introduce you to a paper that was written in 2009, which has a bit of a jocular title, but I think is uh, quite telling and quite revealing. The title is How Active Resistors and Organizational Constipators Affect Healthcare Acquired Infection Prevention Efforts. This is a qualitative study. It involved in-depth phone and in-person interviews conducted with 86 participants from 14 hospitals, big health systems, and it includes CEOs, chiefs of staff, hospital epidemiologists, infection control professionals, ICU directors, nurse managers, and of course, frontline physicians and nurses. And what they found was really quite interesting. And it's not unique just to these hospitals, it's things that I've seen in my experience in this institution and other institutions. It's identified a pervasiveness of active resistors. These are personnel who vigorously and openly oppose various changes in infection control practice. And the second one was organizational constipators, which are mid to high level executives who act as insidious barriers to change, always are polite and say they will help but never really follow through on things. And that's a real issue. And the the, under, or the overarching theme here, here was that active resistors and constipators were identified in all the hospitals surveyed. So that got us thinking back in 2014 with my colleague, Mike Stevens, we published this paper that maybe no one read, but at least we did it as an exercise and helped us with our strategies. It's pushing beyond resistors and constipators, implementation considerations for infection prevention best practices. We argue again that no single recipe exists to the successful implementation of evidence-based infection control. The approach must be flexible, collaborative, and involves high quality evidence, engaging and re-engaging leaders, champions, facilitators, education, execution, evaluation, feedback, and once again, re-engagement. Which gets us to this publication with a bit more recent that I published with Rebecca Bokes, or Rebecca Mullen now, averting a betrayal of trust. It was a commentary in infection control hospital epidemiology Really, the subtitle here is System and Individual Accountability in Healthcare Infection Prevention. And we argue that hospital infection prevention programs are neither staffed nor empowered for administrative oversights. We're not here as the enforcement police. We set infection prevention collaborative standards and identify barriers to processes and outcomes. Really, the accountability of both the system and the individuals of that system fall on senior leadership. So switching gears, and continuing with this theme is despite meticulous preparation and planning, the outcome is never guaranteed. So let me introduce you 
to a Josep or Pep Guardiola, Spanish manager who's currently at Manchester City. Guardiola is considered or regarded as the most innovative coach in Europe. He's very clear in this book that he had that, about him that success is never guaranteed. He's very clear on this topic. He does mention, or it's, it's, it's been highlighted, he's meticulous and thorough in preparation for matches in which every player knows their exact role during all parts of the game. He's also well known for leaving as little to chance as possible. He's frequently known as being nimble with tactics and his formations or the lineup of the team. Never really uses the same lineup all the time or at least twice. However, this is really important. He has an awareness that outcomes are beyond control once the game starts. There essentially are no assurances because there's the opponent. There's the conditions such as the field and the weather. There are the match officials. And, there's, and then, of course, there's luck and there's always human error. And that can always impact the outcome. So why do I raise all that? Because for many individuals, zero hospital acquired infections is the holy grail. And when we talk about zero hospital acquired infections, we're being unrealistic, and we're not being honest with ourselves, with our colleagues, with the community, the community of what we can and cannot control with respect to this element or this, this um, program of patient safety. So to put this in perspective, in 2011, uh, there was a point prevalence study of US hospitals that was published. This was actually published in 2018. The first point prevalence was in 2011, Four percent of hospitalized patients had or had a complication with a healthcare associated infection. In 2015, there was a point prevalence resurvey of U.S. hospitals, and that had gone from four percent to 3.2 percent of hospitalized patients with a healthcare associated infection. Therefore, the risk of having HEI was 16 percent lower in 2015 than in 2011. So, some improvement. I would argue that's actually modest. So the question is, and this is something I published with my colleagues here, Michelle Dahl, Kayla Cooper, Michael Stevens is hospital infection prevention, how much can we prevent and how hard should we try? So let's start with the why question first. As the first tenet of medicine is to do no harm, infection prevention programs should relentlessly pursue reliable, sustainable, and practical strategies for heightened patient safety. That's really why we're doing this. It's what we're supposed to do. HEIs result in significant morbidity, mortality, and cost. This also obliges us to act. But getting to zero HAIs is a soundbite. It's misleading. Why is that? Well, largely because infection prevention science is inexact, is far from being a physical science. Even high quality studies have limitations. Processes are inconsistently implemented, and that's endemic. That's not just a BCU, that is endemic nationwide, internationally. Processes can be controversial. So if that's the case, what is the best practice? Diagnostic strategies in gaming can lead to inexact HAI incidents and false conclusions about preventability, and that certainly does happen or has been known to happen. And of course, hospital administration is key to achieving safety goals. Sometimes keeping leaders focused is a challenge, which gets me to lesson four. If we focus on the processes, the results will generally follow as per Guardiola in this image. So we argue that perhaps up to 70% of ATRs are preventable with that, we should relentlessly strive to minimize potentially preventable AGIs because it's consistent with the Hippocratic Oath of Primum Non Nocere, and part of the public trust. With that, we have to look for practical or satisfied solutions in the real world, advocate for sound policies and improvement in infection prevention science, strive for decisions based on cost benefit, safety, and of course, continue to assess AGI prevention program with rigor. So getting to the processes, it comes down to this. Our infections, our infections are either preventable versus unpreventable hospital-acquired infections. We argue that 70% of ATIs are potentially preventable when the risk reduction measures, i.e. the processes, are reliably implemented. Then you have the remaining 30% that are apparently unpreventable infection, uh, infection despite every agreed upon measure for infection prevention being followed. This is important that we're clear on the processes and that should be our goal is to maximize the processes the outcomes will follow, which gets me to this quote. And I like to quote the Stoics sometimes, and I'm going to com combine a quote with, a uh, I'm going to combine Guardiola with Epictetus, not a great combination, but it'll work well enough for this discussion, is to be clear on the expectations, don't so oversell your outcomes. Now, quoting Epictetus, the infectious disease epidemiologist of days past, happiness and freedom begin with a clear understanding of one principle. Some things are within your control, and some things are not. So my infection prevention advice for Stokes out there is be clear on what we can and cannot control with respect to infection control and outcomes. I think we'll all feel much better about it. We certainly will be honest with the public. 
Lesson five. Yes, the win-loss draw column, also known as the table of positions in soccer, is an accurate predictor of performance. This is a reflection on public health reporting of healthcare associated infections. So what do I mean by that? This is the final English Premier League, League table of positions for 2020, 2021. If soccer is a very simple game for those who don't, don't, aren't too familiar with it. There's in, in the English Premier League, for example, there are 38 matches played. A team gets three points for a win, one point for a tie, no points for a loss. After 38 matches played home and away across the entire bracket here, the top team with the top points wins the tournament. That's it. There's no Super Bowl, et cetera, et cetera. And you can see at the bottom where you have teams number 18, 19, and 20, or the three worst performing teams, they get dropped down below to the league or the minor league below, and the three best teams come up. That is the table of positions. It's an accurate reflector, in my opinion, of organizational performance on the soccer pitch. So how is that relevant to this discussion? Well, this is actually an old map. If I was to update this map now, it would be all green. It's healthcare associated infection reporting laws as of January 2011. So, you know, 11 years later, this is entirely green in which all states have some element of mandatory public reporting of healthcare associated infections. To do that, you have to be thoughtful. So this is a paper I wrote with Michael Edvin, who was then at VCU and now at West Virginia, who published this in the Journal of Possible Infection in the United Kingdom in 2007. And we, we are, our question here is mandatory public reporting in the USA, an example to follow. Well, to make it a good example, to make it effective, we argue that the public reporting of HIIs requires highly accurate data collection, rigorous standardization of methodology with risk adjustment for units and facilities. We certainly don't want to compare, for example, VCU Health to a very small 30 or 40 bed hospital in rural Virginia. That's not an, that's not an apples to apples comparison. We also want something that requires minimal excess costs and really an end product that is useful to patients and fair to hospitals. That can be debated, but let's leave it at that for now. So here's one of the papers published on this, this is in 2014, evaluating the impact of mandatory public reporting. This is on CLABSIS or Central Line Associated Bloodstream Infections, evidence from a national patient safety collaborative. The bottom line, and not to dissect this too, into too much detail, is state groups with mandatory public reporting of CLABSI trended toward greater reductions in central line associated bloodstream infections. Why is that? So let's get to that in a second. So let's give you an example first of public health reporting in Virginia. Now, this has been a bit upended the last two years because of COVID, but we do have data pre-COVID. And if you were interested in finding out how VCU health fares compared to other institutions in Virginia, you need to go to bdh.gov and you see the reference here at the bottom. And this is just an example of, of public reporting of uh, catheter-associated bloodstream infections, catheter-associated urinary tract infections, uh, SIR, which stands for standardized infection ratio in ICUs and inpatient wards in acute care hospitals in Virginia. Uh, you're looking at the SIR, which means if you have a level less than one, then it's green. And it's, all, it's, also, uh, it's also suggests that you're less than you would be expected to have uh, given the kind of nature and scope of the services provided in that hospital. So I have VCU Medical Center down at the bottom. We are consistently less than one year in year out, as you can see through there, low infection rates or device associated infections and green further means that we continue to improve on our rates and are not staying stagnant. You can see some other comparators here, some of the smaller hospitals, but also UVA Medical Center, which I've highlighted here, which will be the next closest comparator, at least with respect to a hospital of our size. So, much like the table of positions, the mandatory reporting of healthcare associated infections is a reflection, in my opinion, of overall performance. You can't just have one bad day or one good day. It's a reflection over the course of a quarter of a year or even years, as you saw in the previous example. It's a comparison between healthcare systems that must be risk adjusted and utilize validated methodology, which we use the CDC National Healthcare Safety Network. It forces healthcare systems to prioritize and implement infection prevention best practices. I think that was a single most important component there of the mandatory reporting. And it may result in financial penalties for poor for performance, particularly from CMS. This further focuses effort and resources in infection prevention and safety. So I am a proponent, of course, as you can imagine, of mandatory public reporting HAIs. Which gets me to lesson six, changing gears but staying on this topic the best players do not always make the best coaches and other relevant thoughts. So 
actually going to a different sport here really briefly. I found this interesting article. It was on tennis, or at least started off with tennis, but it does include other sports. And the title of the article is Playing is Not Coaching. Why so many sporting greats struggle as coaches? So I can introduce to you a certain gentleman, Jose Mourinho, the famous Portuguese coach, who's again considered one of the best uh, football or soccer managers of the current era. But it's, most people don't know that he didn't have a stellar career as a player. In fact, I think he played only a couple of years in Portugal's minor leagues and never was in the prime for the Premier League of the Portuguese Soccer Association and certainly never represent, represented Portugal on the national team. But he is one of the world's leading football managers or soccer coaches. Why is that? Well, playing contributes to coaching skills. For example, the technical and tactical aspects. As a player, you kind of learn that as part of the process of playing. But playing experiences give really a partial view of coaching. There's some really critically important things that are missing, and that's what really happens off the pitch, which includes planning and preparation, the complex orchestration of commitments across all aspects of the business, and the personally challenging reflections and decisions that are required for coaches to engage throughout, throughout their entire career. And that's not only with their team, but also with the management, with the press, you get the point. So this gets me to a really interesting paper that I discovered years back. It is not a very new paper. As you can see at the bottom, it's published in 1999, the Journal of Clinical Cancer Research. And this, uh, the title is called Understanding Ap Academic Medical Centers, Simone's Maxim. It's an editorial, it's a lengthy one, and I encourage you to read it. He starts off by, uh, Dr. Simone starts off by writing, I began years ago to establish personal rules of thumbs, maxims to say, to discern some meaningful patterns in seemingly chaotic events and baffling human behavior. So first maxim, and I think there's like 10 of them, so I'm only gonna go through a couple of them. Maxim one that I've chosen is that leaders are often chosen primarily for characteristics that have little or no concern, or correlation, sorry, with a successful tenure as an actual leader. The examples given here by, by Simone are a long bibliography, scientific eminence, institutional longevity, ready availability, a willingness to not, rock, to not rock the boat, which I think is quite common, or just to, or willingness to accept inadequate resources. To quote him is choosing leaders is not a science, but it is surprising how often management skills, interpersonal skills and experience are undervalued. So on soccer coaches and leaders in academic medicine, I, I argue that street credibility as a player, as players is desirable. It's respected in accomplished commissions and or researchers or educators are likely necessary, but not sufficient qualities. Must have other key qualities to succeed, which include vision, communication, organizational ex execution skills, including the why and the how, as we discussed, awareness or emotional intelligence, and of course, ability to work as a team player. But with that, I mean for and with the team, critically important. So let's get to on-team players. And I'm gonna use a quote from Ted Lasso, you know, the fictitious soccer manager, there is some truth to it. It is a bit, a bit jocular, but uh, let me proceed. Talking to his player here, Jamie, I think that you might be so sure that you're one in a million, that sometimes you forget that out there, you're just one of 11. And if you just figure out some way to turn that me into us, the sky's the limit for you. So with that, let me introduce you really to more real life team player here. And I think this is a great example is Ms. Crystal Dunn on team players. Crystal Dunn, US soccer standout, U.S. women's uh, national soccer team and World Cup winner. She's got a great quote, and I think it's the best one I've seen, actually. I want to be known as a great soccer player and even and an even better teammate in, in the capital letters. I think she's really got it right on this. Not being a good teammate can have some catastrophic consequences. I'll give you just a quick example. In the World Cup of 2010, Fr famed French footballer Nicolas Pinanco was sent home by the France Football Federation. This is not before the tournament, not after the tournament, but after halftime of a game against Mexico in which there was a foul mouth rant and he really laid into his teammates and the coach. And really this was the beginning or the ongoing downward spiral of the French national team to rapidly exit the tournament. And they really things fell apart after this game with the ignominious exit of uh, Mr. Nelka from the team. So not being a team player has consequences for the individual and for the team. So moving on to the next maxim here, personal attitude and team compatibility is grossly underrated in faculty recruiting. The adage is always recruit the best athlete, or in this case, the best scientist, is per Simone, and I agree with him in oversimplification, 
A faculty member may be productive personally, but create an atmosphere that reduces the productivity of everyone else or doesn't help others in matters that are relevant, whether it's research or clinical stuff, things like that. Essentially, this doesn't collaborate with others in either academic or clinical endeavors, and that's a problem. My experience is that rifts and rancor appear when an individual is perceived as not a team player, and that could be a real danger to the dynamics of the team. So lesson seven, teams are assembled for individual characteristics of the players. With that, seek unique talents. And this is really the 20% rule, something they didn't make up. So soccer, as I said, is a simple game. It's 11 players on the pitch. The most common formation is called the 4-4-2. Essentially, the manager chooses the team formation and the style of play, not on the basis of an ideal, but really rather on the unique talents of the available players. This includes speed, strength, fitness, someone being right versus left-footed, deception, dribbling skills, defensive qualities, ability to tackle well, ability to head the ball, vision, awareness on the field, passing ability, on-field leadership, captain, for example, a shot stopper, the goalkeeper, of course, just of course, last but not least, the goal scoring ability. So with that, I want to introduce something I think is really important. And it's really not a, a in academics or an academic medicine term. It's really a, a, a principle that's really was essentially rooted in economics. It's called the 80-20 principle. And in economics, the Pareto principle states that for many outcomes, roughly 80% of consequences or the outputs come from 20% of the causes, causes which are the efforts. So I would encourage you to read the 80-20 principle, secret of achieving more with less. So really the goal here is the key is to work out the few things that are really important and the few methods that will give us what we really want. So what do I mean by that? Well, let's take a look at this, for example, and bring it back to the academic, academic medicine realm. This is a paper by Shannon Felt that was published in 2009, Career Fit and Burnout Among Academic Faculty. This is 556 academic faculty surveyed with an 84% response rate, so not too bad. 68% reported patient care was most meaningful. Others were not research, education, and administration. However, 34% of respondents met the criteria for burnout. In the analysis, it was observed, it was reported that spending less than 20% of time on most meaningful activities was associated with higher rates of burnout, significant differences, 54% versus nearly 30%. So that gets me to this. Leadership goal is really to recognize and cultivate the unique talents of the physicians on the team. Evidence suggests that physicians who spend at least 20% of the professional effort focused on the dimension of work they find most meaningful are at least risk for burnout. And that's critically important and that should not be overlooked by leaders or organizations. So that's exactly what we try to do. The 442 formation of the Division of Infectious Disease is one that looks where we try to cultivate the unique talents of the ID team members. Some focus on HIV care. Some even within their general practice have a focus on non-tuberculous microbacterial specialized care. They're transplant infectious disease specialists, musculoskeletal infection specialists. Those that do administrative things that are highly valuable to institutions such as OPAT oversight, which is outpatient antibiotic therapy. Telehealth is a focus. Medical education of students in, formal, in a formal way is a focus. Medical education of fellows is also a, a formal focus healthcare epidemiology, antimicrobial stewardship, and of course, research and mentorship are all critically important and must be considered as some of the unique talents of this division and of course, of others. Which gets me to lesson eight. The best coaches care personally while seeking the best for the team. So it's the individual and the collective. So I have here insights on management for comfort conversations with renowned coaches. Now I'm a bit of a soccer nerd, so I do a lot of reading on that. Uh, these all happen to be Spanish language books, but the messages are clear and consistent. The first one is Agon Juego, which is play ball uh, by Angel Capa, an Argentine soccer coach. The next one is Palabra de Entrenador, which means the coach's word from Spain. And then Pelota de Papel, which is paper ball from Argentina. And really reflections on leadership, football, the locker room, et cetera, et cetera. And there's a very common theme here. And that common theme is that the best coaches manage talented individuals on a personal level while maintaining a functional team dynamic. So what do I mean by that? Let me give you an example. This is a uh, Senor Vincente de Rosque, who was a famed Spanish soccer coach, uh, many years with Real Madrid, multiple championships there, but more importantly, won the World Cup with Spain. And he really focuses or emphasizing 
the importance of caring about both the individual and the team. Here's a simple fact. Not everyone has equal impact or presence on the pitch or the field. The manager, therefore, must be aware of these inequalities to minimize negativity. And to quote him, my translation from Spanish to English is, the day after a match, nearly all the starters, ones who played, have a lighter training session. It is the job of the head coach to spend that session with those who did not play. I underscore that, those who did not play, to engage them or to keep them engaged, to motivate them and maintain team harmony. Why is that important? Well, because one's negativity, the lack of value and strife that's in on a team, the coach or the manager loses control of the locker room. And there, from there comes a downward spiral where he or she loses the confidence of the players, the management, and then, of course, ultimately of the fans. Which gets me to this really important paper that was published. Actually, it was published in the New York Times. So it's freely open uh, to, to anyone, actually. Uh, I think it's open access, this one. And it's really on the perfect work environment. And it's, uh, it was, I think it was a special issue called the work issue. And the subtitle, the title here is what Google learned from its quest to build the perfect team. New research reveals surprising truths about why some work groups thrive and others falter. Fact here is employee performance optimization, the, the consistent strive to optimize everything, optimize outputs is not enough. And the bulk of modern work is team-based. So how are teams most effective? Well, I'll summarize it briefly, and they call this Project Aristotle. There were 180 teams studied across the organization, so it's not just one or two teams that worked at. What's critically important here is that the conclusion was that it's not the who of the team that was most impactful. It's team behavioral norms, the dynamic of the team which is most important. This is which in which you have psychologically safe environments being the norm, leading to bonding, which was most critical for high-functioning teams. When we talk about that, psychologically safe, it also has, it's an environment where leaders encourage and promote honest and compassionate conversations about ideas, challenges, frictions. Yes, frictions between the team have to be discussed in a manner that is constructive for everyone. And everyday annoyances to address these needs are critically, critically important to keep the dynamic moving forward in a positive way. Teams are most effective when work is purposeful, personally integrated, and not just focused on efficiencies or optimization as it's commonly said. So I'm gonna to get to uh, lesson number nine, which is coaches, leaders sometimes need to make very difficult, uncomfortable decisions for the better of the team and really of the mission. So by way of that, I'm gonna give you three examples of famous footballers cut from the roster. On the far left is Diego Maradona from Argentina who was cut, I think a week or two before the 1978 World Cup. He was an 18 year old soccer phenomenon that was the up and coming player for the world to notice was cut by the manager, Menotti, right before the tournament, probably because he thought it was too young and wouldn't fit in with the rest of the, the scheme that he had for that tournament. Argentina went on to win the World Cup in 1978. The second one is Michael Laudrup, the famed a Danish footballer who was the captain of the, uh, the Denmark national team, who was cut a couple of weeks before the 1992 Euro finals, again, for open opposition to the coach, uh, the coach's um, strategies, et cetera, et cetera. Denmark went on to win the 1992 European Cup. Most recently in 2018, you have the famed French footballer, Adrien Rabiot of uh, Paris Saint-Germain and Juventus, you know, having kind of an open row with the, the coach about his playing time and where he thought he should be in the scheme of things, was cut right before the World Cup. And as you know, the French went on and won the World Cup. All of these decisions could not have been easy for the managers to make, but they were important decisions to make. Talented footballers cut from the team either due to an experience, poor team tactical fit, or attitudinal problems cannot be easy to, to, uh, to to accommodate or decisions to make, but they again are important for managers to be brave in the face of these decisions. So making tough choices can be unpleasant. With that, it is definitely important to listen to a diversity of perspectives, solicit feedback, not once, not twice, but thrice, promote inclusivity, and of course, foster collaboration. And even when you've done all that, you still have to make the decisions. So with respect to difficult decisions and conversations, you know, these uh, had these with, with respect to personal decisions, hiring, firing, even redirecting individuals, giving negative feedback, performance, even team fit, prioritizing program and group needs at the expense of other competing interests. You can't do everything for everyone at the same time. Sometimes individuals are upset that their projects are a little bit backburnered while we take something else on, hopefully with the plan of coming back to that initial project that upset someone else. 
important thing is here is that individuals will often accept the final decisions if opinions were heard, the process was inclusive, diverse, and transparent. Doesn't make it necessarily easier, but does make it possibly slightly more valid. Which gets me to the last lesson. Reconnect with what inspired you to your career, whether you're an infectious disease specialist, a different specialist, a care partner, whatever healthcare professional you may be, you may be reconnect with what, with what got you there. So with that, I'm introducing to you the famous uh, footballer, Mia Hamm. He's probably one of the most talented and well-known American female soccer players. Won, I think, a couple of World Cups with the women's national team. This is a beautiful quote that I found from Mia Hamm. That somewhere behind the athlete you've become in the hours of practice and the coaches who have pushed you as a little girl who fell in love with the game and never looked back. Play for her. That's what you're playing for. So with that, be mindful. And I discuss this with the fellows and people around me. Be mindful and reconnect with what drove you to become a healthcare profession. Relentlessly strive to recapture that motivation and energy. That's critically important. So in summary, life imitates art and soccer imitates life. What are the lessons learned, at least from my perspective? That wins and losses are part of life and sport, setbacks abound. The importance of leadership during times of crisis and burnout is paramount. We need to focus on organizational and, and individual factors. Resilience and grit are huge, particularly on the individual front. Organizational agendas may be discordant at times. Start with why for the foundational basis of all your actions, critically important. Beware of resistors and constipators. Stay true to the mission, stay the course. Despite meticulous, meticulous planning and execution, the outcome is never guaranteed. It's important that we be clear on that. From a perspective of infection prevention science, our science is imperfect. Zero infections is a sound bite. Be clear on what we can and cannot accomplish. On the pitch and in the hospital, focus on the processes. With reliability, I might add, the outcomes will generally follow. With that, perhaps 70 to 75% of HAIs are preventable with the current science. The table of positions, much like the public reporting of healthcare assisted infections, is a generally adequate reflection of organizational performance, something I believe in. Neither the best players nor the most talented clinicians and researchers make the best leaders. Street credibility is as important as management and interpersonal skills. Non-team players are potentially the most threatening force to a successful group dynamic. I've seen that on the soccer field. I've seen that in professional environments. Teams are selected and assembled on the unique characteristics of of those individuals. With that, I strongly urge you to focus on the 20%. Leaders should recognize, nurture, and advocate the protected time for these unique talents of team members so that they flourish, so they not burn out, so they feel valuable. The best coaches care personally about individuals while seeking the best for the team, that's the collective good. Leaders, as we know, must commonly make tough decisions. Because if you're a leader, don't shy away from them. Although you're not always going to be popular, these decisions can be respected when a diversity of perspectives are solicited and the process is transparent. Last but not least, be mindful and relentlessly strive to reconnect with what inspired you to a career in medicine or to what drove you to be the person or the professional that you currently are. I'd like to acknowledge some very important people, the VCU Infectious Diseases Team in service, everyone under the umbrella does amazing work. I'm super, super proud of them. I'm honored to be the division chair. Rebecca Mullen, who's been helpful on administrative fronts and on, very academic, on various academic uh, measures that, uh, that we've done over the years in publications. Of course, our assistants, Peggy Andrews, Tanya Murkerson, and Paula Thompson were absolutely there for us all the time. Then of course, my colleagues who have been so generous with their feedback, their time, and really to the insights they've given me over the years. Dr. Julie Reznicek, Dr. Jillian Raybould, Dr. Sangeeta Sastry, Dr. Priya Nori, the Albert Einstein School of Medicine for her generous time to review my slides and her feedback. Of course, our department chair, Dr. Patricia Sym, and last but not least, Dr. Richard Wenzel, who is a very important mentor and individual to me in the field, not only of infectious diseases, but also in professional development. So I will leave you with this quote before I say thank you from Megan Rapinoe, famed American footballer. It's hard to beat somebody that never gives up. Thank you very much for your attention. It's been an absolute honor to spend the last 50 minutes with you. And I hope that we'll have some questions in the next uh, couple of minutes. So thank you again. Thank you, Dr. Behrman. Um, 
I want to say I want to go visit your home library and pick out some of those books. I uh, may not be able to read Spanish, but I think many of them uh, sound good. I uh, well, thank you. should definitely. I'll try to write down some of the names that you listed. Thank you so much for an inspirational talk. Um, we have a, a few questions, but Dr. Syme, do you have any reflections or comments first? Yeah, no, no, very much enjoy that, um, Gonzalo. And, um, you know, when I, when I hear talks on leadership, it always makes me think about what I'm doing that might be good, but more importantly, what I'm doing that might not be. So, you know, lots of food for thought because remember we're all leaders, right? I mean, every one of us, you know, on this call and on this Zoom is a leader in our own right. And, um, you know, always good to, to think about how we are perceived as leaders and, and how we can continue to do well, because many of you do amazing things, but, but also, you know, for myself in particular, how do I continue to improve? Now, I do have one criticism, Gonzalo. Where's the Scottish Premier League in all this? I'm very sorry. It was a terrible <laughs> oversight. Dr. Bergman also told me that I didn't include Zlatan Ibrahimovic in the famous footballer. So that'll be important. No, and, and this is such an important topic, you know, burnout and um, the resilience for our department. I and mean, we have been on the front lines. Many of you on this call have for two years have been on the front lines, you know, the ID division, the hospital medicine, critical mm -hmm. care, ED, like amazing work. Um, and I, you know, I think we do have some champions of this with, you know, great knowledge yourself and others. I don't know if Lisa Ellis is on the call, but I see Kurt Sessler's. Um, I'm going to try and be, may have him be a panelist because he's thought about a lot about this and presented nationally in the critical care space. So if we can make him a panelist as, as we're having these discussions, I don't think this discussion should stop at one o'clock today. It's really important. Thank you. Gonzalo. Thank you for the kind words and for the support always. Any other questions? Uh, we can start maybe with uh, one question here. Um, I agree with you, Dr. Behrman, especially during the beginning of the COVID, healthcare professionals were never in control of the narrative and political people forced us to give public false promises. Uh, how can we avoid pitfalls when the next pandemic comes? I don't know if you want to give a comment or response to that. Of course. You know, what I would say is I've learned a lot about communicating, particularly with, with the public or the press for the last couple of years. I think we should follow three important pillars. Pillar number one is state what you know at that time. Pillar number two is state what assumptions we're taking or making to come to a certain decision or strategy. And pillar number three is to be very clear that as the knowledge changes, as our understanding of matters changes, our strategies could also change. With that, I think it provides a level of clarity that we hope, or I hope, would be less erosive to public trust. Once you lose the public's trust, it's hard to get it back. It's really hard to get it back. So those are my recommendations. We've written papers, uh, both editorials and academic papers, on lessons learned from COVID-19. My fear is that if we don't institutionalize some of these things uh, with related to many things, we will essentially repeat the problem or repeat, repeat our mistakes in the future. And the other question here may be a little more personal. Um, what's more history on your personal soccer experience as being part of a team, especially as a goalkeeper? I yeah. um, think they just wanted you to kind of reflect on your past as the leader goalkeeper. Well, I mean, I, I mean, I don't want to talk too much about myself as a footballer, as a soccer player, but I do play. I played all my life. I'm Argentine, so you kind of, I think you're born with a football in utero. You know, come out with a soccer ball in, in utero uh, per se. Uh, where it's very common for everyone to play soccer. I was very fortunate to attend a, a very good university and be the goalkeeper for Colgate University, a Division I college program. It's been very successful and was successful then and now. Um, but I think what I would take from that is that you learn a lot of things by playing on a team at that level, is that there, there are 22 players there that are all very good, and you might be one of the three goalkeepers, but you don't always play every match. You play most of them and you get dropped, and you'll make mistakes. And the question is, how do you respond to those mistakes? You know, I've been dropped from the lineup a couple of times. And you sit on the bench for a couple of games before you come back and it hurts. But those that can really have that grit to stick, stick with it, that's really important. And the last thing I would say is the issue of teamwork. Once there's a non-team player, a high school soccer team, a college soccer team, a rec team, even some of the rock bands I've played in over the years, someone's not a team player, it doesn't go over well. And that's really the biggest cause of strife that I've observed. Thank you. Um, 
we did invite uh, Dr. Sessler here as a okay. panelist, so I want to uh, turn it over to you for a second uh, to reflect on this conversation uh, around burnout and your work you're leading. Thanks. Yeah, no, uh, first of all, uh, Gonzalo, a tour de force, a, a wonderful, I, I really love the analogies and the and it's right spot on, um, wonderful work. Uh, thanks for your grand rounds. One of the things that uh, looking into burnout, uh, primarily in the ICU setting and some of the work that we've um, done, uh, and some of that's been collaboration nationally and looking at nurses, physicians, kind of the whole team is, is really the importance of team um, the challenge of meaningful versus menial work, um, and I think that's an ongoing challenge that, uh, and fitting in with that is the problem of control. And, you know, I think a lot of the folks who um, are frontline workers, uh, that the locus of control is not necessarily with them, particularly in terms of the menial work. So I don't know if you have additional comments about um, uh, to expand a little bit more on that how does one optimize um, the role of the frontline worker uh, with senior leadership and others to, you know, I think a lot of your comments were right on spot on in terms of saying, okay, there's got to be an interplay and this has got to work in some meaningful fashion. I, I, I think that's one of those key areas. So I'd be interested in further expansion about uh, how to optimize that. Well, I have to say that my, I probably, Whenever I've gone into something, whether it's sport or even professionally, I've probably had as many wins as I've had losses. Okay, so my accomplishments are very modest. But I will say, as we moved, and with the help of Dr. Syme, of course, this predated her, but she was absolutely helpful, hugely helpful in the end to make this happen for us. We were able to negotiate the division of infectious disease out of the common comp plan. Okay, we're still held to our view targets, et cetera, et cetera. But it got to the point where being seen or having an expectation in which we had to generate certain RVUs that were not really feasible for most of us, just because of the nature of what we do, okay, was demoralizing for team. That's the beginning of a quick downward spiral of mass exodus. So part of the argument was, if we were really serious about maintaining a team, keeping the team functional, we have to be able to support them clinically Set clear expectations. We have to do X number of clinics, number of weeks on service, et cetera, et cetera. But give them time also to flourish. I'm not talking big time here, but find their niches and make sure that that niche is respected. Some like to do student teaching. Some are fellowship directors. Others like non-tuberculous mycobacteria and want to have their dedicated clinic to that. You know, that may not be a high revenue clinic, but we don't want to quash that. It's consistent with organizational goals. It's consistent with personal goals. So that's how we argue. Uh, we've argued for those six. All of these, of course, start with a why question. Why are we doing this? Well, to really preserve the mission of the institution, but more important, mm -hmm. the patients, the institution, but keep our team, I would say, healthy and mostly happy. Not everyone's happy all the time. Couple that with important leadership to help us, so just to sign the Department of Medicine to stand behind us. Otherwise, it would not have been successful. So I've not argued to the level of the frontline workers, such as nursing staff, care partners, that's beyond my realm. But I think the same mindset has to go into that. Like our nurses are super valuable. Our care partners, our ward clerks are super valuable. This is the minimum that's required to keep people engaged. It's not just the, it's not just the salary. It's the schedules, the cross coverage, it's, it's the sense of community that's kind of it. Those are all part of the discussion. Again, yeah. very, very um, modest in my accomplishments in these things, but that's what I've learned. Yeah, no, I totally agree. I'm a, I'm a big fan of Tate Shanafelt and all the work that he's done. And, you know, one of the nidus is, is that control and uh, uh, flexibility uh, being one of the key ones. And I think just as a last kind of, then I'll add, you know, then I'll be quiet, to it, but is uh, I think the importance, and you mentioned it, of EI, of, of emotional intelligence and, and being able to work in a team and understand where the other team members are coming from, working hard to understand their position and yours and how that all works together so that the team can be most effective. Yeah. So I like the way you blended that in with uh, with your comments today, which were, again, excellent. Thank you. I mean, I think maybe the ID team, you have to ask them, if I get sick of me talking about a community of practice and extended family, which is what we are. You know, as you know, an extended family has a diversity to it, 
but we're all still family. So we all work towards the same goal, delivering infectious disease expertise, care, research, et cetera, et cetera, each with their own, need, their own areas of, of uh, interest. But here's the catch. If someone has an issue, we all have an issue. So if someone has to go on a leave, we all help. If someone gets sick, we all help. If there's a family crisis, we all help. So if something happens to a team member, it happens to all team members. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I think that's the end here of our uh, grand rounds. And um, thank you, Dr. Behrman. We really appreciate that the wonderful presentation. And I, uh, we can track the number of downloads of your, uh, your, your presentation afterwards. So uh, I think that the books and the chapters and things that you listed here, uh, really phenomenal work and uh, appreciate you highlighting all of this. So thank you for what you do and, and your team. And uh, thanks for a uh, wonderful talk. Really appreciate it. Thank you for the kind Thank comments. You. Thank you for your attention, everyone. Have a good afternoon. Thank you. Cheers. We'll put the CME code back up in the chat uh, and close out with the QR code. Thanks, everybody. Have a good afternoon.